It's good to see all of you. How you doing? Good, good. Would you stand with us? We're going to open up in prayer. and We are going to get our hearts ready or ask God to get our hearts ready to worship him because he's worthy. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you, God, um, because you're good, Lord. Thank you for your grace and thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the cross, Lord, that, um, that we can be here, Lord, before you, um, calling on your name, Lord, and having the confidence that you hear us because of your grace, Lord. So we just pray, God, that tonight you would, you would do a mighty work, Lord, that everything that is done in this place, God, would bring you glory and would point us all to who you are, Lord. Bless our pastor as he teaches. Bless this time of worship, Father. We pray that um, you would inhabit the praises of your people, Lord. And, uh, Lord, remove anything that might be a distraction, God. Help us, Lord, to focus solely on you. We thank you, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship. And high on the mountain, I will be lifting my voice and in the valley. We'll be dancing for joy in every season. You are worthy in every moment. You're wonderful. You're wonderful. You're wonderful. You're wonderful. High on the mountains. I will be lifting my voice and in the valleys I will be dancing for joy in every season You are worthy in every moment You're wonderful You're wonderful You're so
I will trust in you, I will not be moved High on the mountains, I will be lifting my voice And in the valleys, I will be dancing for joy In every season, you are worthy In every moment, you're wonderful You're wonderful, you're wonderful, you're wonderful, you're wonderful, you're wonderful, you're wonderful.
Father And only God is mighty Savior And only God is like no other And only God mighty Savior and only God is He's like no other and only
Father, we do, again, thank you, Lord. There is none like you, God. We worship you, Lord. We adore you. We praise your name. Your word says to be still and know that you are God, Lord. So we just take a second just to ponder Lord, on your goodness and your grace for us, Lord, tonight. Your people are here, Lord, still before you, God, speak to us. fountain I drink from oh he is my song oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide and the ransom for my life oh he is my song oh he is my song you are good so good you're so good you are so good amen church you are good for you are good good oh you are good good because you are good you're so good so good let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails and the anchor of my ways oh he is my song he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins and the echo of my days oh he is my song he is my song come on guys for you are good good you are good Good, good. Oh, cause you are good, you're so good, are so good. You're so good, God. You're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let you're never gonna let, never gonna let me die. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me die. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me die. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me die. 
So you're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. Cause you're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Cause you're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Cause you're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. Cause you are good, good, oh, you are good, you are good, you are good. so good you are so good to us father we thank you god lord for that simple truth god that you are good to us god we thank you lord again for everything you're gonna do lord and god i pray lord that our hearts would be open now lord to hear what you have to say to us lord tonight we thank you again for your presence lord fill us teach us now god as we dig into your word lord we thank you we praise you we ask these things in Jesus' name. Together we all greet and said, all right, I should have had you guys stand, but you guys can turn to each other and say, good evening. That went fast. That went fast. Well, how are you guys doing tonight? Doing all right. Praise God. A um, couple of prayer requests and some announcements before we get into our study here. Let's see. Friday night, don't forget, we have our Spanish study at 7 o'clock. And so I encourage you to keep that in prayer and invite those, truly invite those who um, maybe could benefit from the study. And then on Saturday morning, the men get together for Proverbs and prayer at 8 a.m. in room 2. And that's always a blessing. I encourage you guys to come out for that. It really is, uh, honestly, uh, life-changing, you know, to be able to pray for the church, for our families, and uh, just gleaning from the Proverbs, uh, for men especially, we get really the wisdom that we need to live life uh, victoriously. I um, also want to let you know the men's study started up yesterday, and just in case you're still interested in uh, being a part of that, you can see Henry, and he'll give you a notebook, and uh, that way you won't fall behind, but it was such a blessing getting together with the guys, and uh, and I just encourage you, if you can, guys, uh, come out on Wednesday nights. Uh, missions night this Sunday night, May 28th at 6 p.m. Uh, really looking forward to this. Uh, mark your calendars, and I know for some of you, normally you don't come out on a Sunday night, so that's why it's good to give you a little advance notice, but we're going to hear from our missionaries in Cambodia, Nepal, and uh, there's this gal, her name is Holly. Uh, she uh, leads up a mission work there in Cambodia where they do so many things. It's a girls' discipleship home. They rescue uh, women who are caught in sex, sexual slavery. And uh, hearing from uh, Joshua and Katie, Tanil, uh, Pankaj, uh, uh, Fernando's going to be sharing on, on Mexico. I don't know if he knows that or not, but uh, and now, now he does, man. <laughs> And uh, we really, I think God blesses churches that um, are, are, are involved in missions. I think God blesses churches that, that love Israel, different things, you know. So really encourage you to uh, come out on uh, Sunday night. And don't forget, we do have an Israel trip coming up uh, April 10th through the 19th, uh, 2018. 
If you're interested in that, and I hope you are, uh, sign up in the back. You can talk to Ray if you have any questions regarding that. I also want to just ask, just in case you guys are able to, after service today, we have a we're asking that the guys can maybe uh, stay around and help us with the chairs and set up on Sunday because this Saturday is our young ladies conference. And so if you guys can afterwards hang out and we'll work together. It's kind of cool. It's symbolic of the fact that when we work together as a church, uh, we get things done. And it's so cool how um, we do a, a better job and we do it uh, in a, an easier fashion when we get together. And so again, just in case, too, please uh, bathe this event in prayer. I don't know if you've been praying or not, but if not, uh, I'll ask God to forgive you right now. And uh, please, you know how important this is? I mean, this could be the difference between a girl uh, giving herself away sexually because she doesn't realize how precious she is to God and not. This can be life-changing. This can be the difference between some girl marrying some jerk or waiting on the Lord you know, to marry a guy who loves her. And so it's a huge, huge uh, difference. And so um, just in case you haven't signed up or maybe you know a young lady that could benefit from it, they can still sign up online and even that day uh, show up. If for some reason, you know, it's a last-minute uh, decision, uh, they can show up at the door. I guess it's an extra $2, but I think it'll be worth it. And so um, prayer request tonight for Arden. Uh, this is Erilyn's nephew. He's two years old, and he's being hospitalized, uh, and so he's really swollen. Shelly showed me a picture of him, and uh, the doctors don't really know everything that's going on, and so she asked for prayer. Uh, uh, some of you might know Tyler. Uh, this is his son, and so let's go before the Lord. Lord, we thank you that we can come into your presence, Lord, and ask for forgiveness and know that you actually do wash away our sins and you separate those things out of our lives that don't belong. We thank you for that, Lord. Father, I pray that you would hear our cries as we lift up little Arden to you. Uh, Father, just asking that you heal him, knowing, Lord, that you do use physicians and, and doctors and nurses and medicine and those things. But, Lord, nothing apart from you. Lord, give them wisdom, Lord, as they take care of him. And I pray that you would continue to work in this family, Lord. And we know, as we're going to see again, and again and again tonight and throughout the book of Job that where there is pain, there is purpose, Lord. And I pray that whatever it is, Lord, that you're trying to do in everyone's life, that we would uh, take heed, that we would grow in our understanding of you, Lord, even as Job did. And so, Lord, we thank you for tonight. We pray for the event this Saturday, Lord, that you bless it in every way, that you would handpick the young daughters of the king that you would want to come out and, Lord, that you would do a work. And even tonight, Lord, bind the enemy. Lord, don't let him do what he wants to do in the hearts of your beautiful people. If there's anyone here who's chained by the enemy, we pray that tonight you would set them free because the enemy does not belong here and he does not belong in the lives of your people, Lord. And so I pray the blood of Jesus over their life. And we thank you for the cross, Lord, and for what you've done. And so, Lord, I, I pray again, just have your hand upon our hearts as we study your word tonight and as we have partake of communion bless this time we pray in jesus name amen all right if you have a bible tonight let's open up to job chapter 13 you know the bible says that god works all things together for good to those who love him and are the called according to his purpose in Romans 8.28. And I, you know, so many different things going on, whether it be a plumbing problem at home. You know, today my wife called me. She said that this side of the house is backed up. And for whatever reason, it happens in our house periodically. And, uh, you know, you can get flustered, you know, when those things happen. You can even, you know, whatever, trip out. You get afraid and... Um, you know, but at the end of the day, this has happened to us, you know, 27 times. <laughs> and God always pulls us through. You know, God always provides uh, the plumber or the wisdom or the finances that are necessary. And so why is it that we freak out, you know, when those things happen? We shouldn't stress. We shouldn't sin. We shouldn't worry. I mean, that's nothing compared to what, you know, like the Alvarez family is going through, you know, as Nadine is fighting cancer. 
you know, and you look at something like that, and again, that's a tough situation, but, you know, in studying the book of Job, when, we're, when we go through things like this, and, and I, and I got to tell you, you know, some of you here, you're probably suffering in, in ways, and you're going through trials that are tremendous, but if you're not, you will one day. You guys know that, right? We're going we're gonna to reach that point. Something's going to happen. A, a child will die. A, a loved one will die. A parent will die. A friend will die. You know, uh, we're going to be facing things and calamities and the roof falls down. And, and, you know, when we're there, you know, it's so cool to have studied the book of Job and, and, and God will prepare us because when we're there, we'll, we won't, like, fall away. You know, we'll be able to go through it like Job did, not with a, you know, plastic Christianity, not one that, you know, just quotes cliches and says, well, that's, you know, you know, you know whatever, you work Romans 8.28, don't even really, you know, mean it, but you say it. I mean, we're talking about when you, when you draw near to God and you're being honest with him, how you feel, and you pour out your heart. But even in the midst of all those things, as you're talking to God and you're dialoguing with him, because he wants you to do that. He doesn't want you to just throw up cliches. He wants to, to, for you to get personal with him. But even when you're there, you don't lose heart. You know, you don't stop believing. You don't lose faith. That, that's what really happened to Job. And as you're going through those, those times, it's a witness, man, as people are watching. Because you're, you know, you stay on course even though you get hit so hard. You know, tonight in Job chapter 13, we, we jump right into his sufferings and heartache. Remember, after having lost all ten of his children, they died in one day. Think about that. Losing all of his wealth, all of it, all of his health from head to toe. He's covered with boils. He's in constant pain. And then, to make matters worse, his wife is embittered, and his friends turn out to be miserable comforters, you know. And so... You know, they, their friends may have had good intentions, but they were, when you really look at what they said, they were, they, hered, they were heretical and they were judgmental. And so we read Job's response here in Job 13. Notice what he says in verse 1. He says, Behold, my eye has seen all this, my ear has heard and understood it. What you know, I also know. I am not inferior to you. You know, if you go back in your Bible to chapter 12, verse 3, he said the same thing there. I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you. You know, they were kind of just sharing general truths about God's sovereignty and how God disciplines his children. And you guys know that, right? You guys know that God's on the throne, God's in control, and that's a general truth. And if a Christian or if a believer gets out of line, God will discipline that person. And so Job is saying, you know, I know those things, but, you know, you guys are saying that the reason I'm suffering is because I'm in sin. And Job knew in the deepest part of his heart that that was not the reason that he was suffering. And so his friends, you know, were, you know, whatever. They had got a degree in theology. They knew the Bible generally, but they lacked the wisdom to apply it personally. They were not sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And, and we need to be, you guys. I mean, as we go through life as sufferers, as we go through life as comforters, don't just, you know, throw out Bible passages. I mean, praise God for his word, but make sure that as you're doing those things, that you're really sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Lord, what's going on? in her life what's going on in his life lord show me and and be sensitive to that you know because his friends definitely weren't you know job he kind of wanted his day in court so to speak he, he wants to talk to god and there's nothing wrong with that he didn't want to talk to these friends who were basically talking nonsense and I'll just tell you that every once in a while, you got to do someone. you got to give someone the hand. you got to do that every once in a while. You know, you're, you're, you're talking foolishness. You're, you're talking smack. You know, go away. i, I got to talk to God. i got to talk to the one who really knows what's going on. That's what Job said in verse 3. But I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to, to reason with God. But you forgers of lies, you're all worthless physicians, 
Oh, that you would be silent and it would be your wisdom. You know, his friends were supposed to be physicians uh, for the soul, kind of instruments of healing to the inner man. But they were 100% unable to diagnose him or prescribe anything that would have been helpful. They were, he says right there in verse 4, worthless physicians. How many of you here have ever gone to visit someone in the hospital, just out of curiosity? Someone who's sick, and, and you go, and, and you want to, you know, you comfort them, and, and instead you just, uh, like, you do the opposite of that. I mean, it's almost like you're an instrument of the devil when you're going to try to help them. And imagine they're there, they're hurting, they're dying, they're suffering, and they end up calling you, you know, go away, you're a worthless physician. That, that's what was going on there. Imagine that. Job said there in verse 3, I would rather speak to the Almighty to reason with him because you're all forgers of lies. Now, the word forgers is interesting in the Hebrew language. It's also translated smear. The NIV, the NLT, they translate it that way. He, he said, you smear me with lies. The Amplified Bible even says this, you defame my character most untruthfully. And so there's a guy, whatever, he's suffering, he's going through whatever he is, he's going through, and then there's someone else over there who's talking smack, gossip, slander, bad things about that person. You know, and I don't know for sure if they were doing it in other places. They may have been. It kind of sounds like that into the Hebrew language. I don't know if you've ever had someone uh, do that you know, to you, backbite about you, gossip about you, slander, and then somehow you, found, you find out. You know, they're saying something bad about you, and then you walk into the room. Oh, hello. <laughs> you know, I, you know, stuff like that. You know, and, and that's what Job's going through. I mean, you know, heartache upon heartache for Job. His friends really just compounded the pain, forging lies instead of truth. You know, Job says it would have been better off for you just to be quiet. You know, be silent. Man, just, just being there a lot of times is better than even saying stuff, huh? You know, I'm sure you've heard that maxim, it's better for people to suspect you're a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt, right? We got to be careful what we say. Some people just run their mouth. Be careful. Job's friend Eliphaz was wrong, Bildad was bad, and Zophar was the worst so far, if you know what I mean. These three friends. Uh, some believe Zophar to be the youngest because he spoke last, and he was the most absent of wisdom. And so, you know what, man? Job warns them. He warns them in verse 13 of this chapter. In verse 6, I'm sorry, he says, Now, now hear my reasoning and heed the pleadings of my lips. Will you speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for him? Will you show partiality for him? Will you contend for God? Will it be well when he searches you out? Or, or can you mock him as one mocks a friend? He will surely rebuke you if you secretly show partiality. Will not his excellence make you afraid and the dread of him fall upon you? Your platitudes are proverbs of ashes. Your defenses are defenses of clay. You know, and so here it's almost as if Job gives his friends a warning, you know, for they were terrible representatives of God, and yet they were claiming to speak on behalf of God. And that's a, that's a really scary place to be. You know, I had asked you guys to pray for me because I was meeting with my friend, uh, Paul, and uh, I hadn't seen him in 25 years. And so when I went to uh, IHOP to meet him, uh, the waitress kind of thought that, that they were already there. She's like, oh, they're over there. And so I looked, and uh, I didn't see them. And so she came back, and she said, are they there? And I said, I don't think they're there, but I'm not 100% sure because I haven't seen him in 25 years, you know. So I'm not really sure what he looks like. But, you know, so I called him up, and he wasn't there yet. And we, you know, we had... Uh, finally met up, man, and, and you know, here I am, and you know, for me, 
the thing that just really consumed me as I'm having breakfast with my friend, he was my best friend for years, is I just want to be a good representative of God. You know, I don't want to be some Bible thumper, you know, Christian that would just, you know, turn him away and not show him love or friendship. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we all have to make a decision of whether or not we're going to be Christians. And so, you know, I don't know if he's really going to make that decision. I don't know 100% sure where he's at in his relationship with God. You know, but, but I just thought to myself, I said, I just want to be a friend to him. I, don't want, I want to show him love. I'll, I'll talk about God, and we did. It was cool. You know, right before we were going to eat, they didn't eat. They just kind of paused, and they looked at me, and I said, is it okay if I pray? And they're like, yeah, you know. And, and, and they did, and we did together. But, you know, we had to be so careful that we don't misrepresent God. I mean, we've had crusades. So many things that are killed in the name of Christianity. And we've, I think, because of uh, sometimes our obnoxiousness, we've turned people away from the faith. Be careful. I'm not saying you can't, you know, say things that might offend others because, you know, sometimes that's what needs to take place. But just make sure that you are led by the Lord, lest you become like these guys, so self-righteous. You know, right here, Job warns them. He warns them about that. You know, he tells them, man, you guys got to be careful because you're claiming to speak on behalf of God, and that's a scary place to be. You know, when I read this section here, there's an element of, uh, I was thinking about James chapter 3, verse 1. Remember that passage that says, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. And so here they're going to him. They're claiming to speak on behalf of God. It's kind of like a teacher. If we dare to speak on behalf of God, we better make sure we're speaking applicable truth. Because God will judge teachers, and ju God will judge counselors, and God will judge judges, those who are judgmental when, you know, we, they, we shouldn't be. That's what Job is saying here. You know, it's kind of funny. Sometimes my wife, she tells me this, uh, tongue-in-cheek, and you guys know what that means, right? Half true, half not true, but she says this to me sometimes. She says, if I were you, I'd be real scared. <laughs> you know, you're teaching the Bible. Ooh, if I were you, I'd be real scared. And, and, it's, and so I tell her that now, too. <laughs> You know, and in a sense, there should be that healthy fear. Let not many of you become teachers knowing that you're going to receive a stricter judgment. If you can't tame the tongue and you just shoot off from the hip, you just vent your feelings, you're not really teaching the word, then God's going to get you. That's kind of what Job is saying right here. And he was right because it's kind of interesting when God himself does show up in the book of Job, and he sheds light, they would have experienced a swift and severe sentence of God unless they didn't offer the sacrifices that God called them to and unless they, they didn't receive the intercession that Job gave for them. And so we read that in Job 42, 7 and 8. And so there, you know, Job is warning them, if I were you, I'd, I'd be afraid. Man, you better be careful what you say and, and another thing that I found interesting, if you noticed in verse 8 and in verse 10, there's the word partiality. Partiality. And I found it interesting when I came across this verse twice, because, you know, here they are, they're coming against Job. Maybe, just maybe, there was someone out there who had something against Job, and these three friends of that someone who was out there kind of tilted the scales against him. You know, sometimes the truth is people will come against you or they'll judge you simply because they're friends with so-and-so who doesn't like you. And even though it has nothing to do with truth, they'll show partiality or favoritism. So maybe there was some of that going on. You know, the Lord knows. I mean, you know, you guys know how it is a lot of times when people are making a judgment about you, they're going to a lot of times believe 
what they want to believe. If they don't like you, they'll believe the worst. Maybe there was some of that going on. I don't know. I know that somehow they were showing partiality. They were definitely claiming to contend for God. They were in the process, however, actually mocking God. That's what Job says. You see, Job just wants to pour out his heart. And we have to let people do that. Look at verse 13. He says, hold your peace with me and let me speak. Then let come on me what may. Why do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in my hands? And here he is, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation, for a hypocrite could not come before him. Listen carefully to my speech and to my declaration with your ears. See now, I have prepared my case. I know that I shall be vindicated. Who is he who will contend with me? If now I hold my tongue, I perish. You know, Job says to his friends there in verse 13, hold your peace with me. Uh, literally, he tells them, be quiet. <laughs> Let me speak. And then verse 14, it's an interesting passage. Why do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in my hands? Essentially expresses the fact that he knows he's pushing it to the edge with God, man. That his questions and complaints now might arouse God's judgment on his life. God actually might slay him. Because he's just like, you know, Lord, I don't get it. Lord, what's up? Lord, let's talk. You know, and I don't know where you guys are, are in all this kind of stuff. You know, some of you here, uh, you know the Bible. See, Job didn't have the Bible. He didn't have any of the Bible. It was just what God had revealed to him personally. And he had a pretty good grip of what was going on. We have the whole Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, we have the cross. We have Jesus. So for us, it's a little different. doesn't mean you can't pour out your heart to God when something you know, terrible happens. I think we all should be able to do that. You know, I, I talked to one guy, and uh, after a back surgery, he was, from that point forward, pretty much not able to walk. You know, and, you know, back surgeries. I mean, you go in, you're supposed to come out better. But imagine you go in for a back surgery and you come out, you can't walk anymore. But you know what? I've never, never, in all the years that it's been, it's been many years now, I've never once heard him complain. Not one time. And he always says this. He always tells me this. It's nothing compared to what Jesus went through. And I think that's pretty cool. There's other people, that's pretty much all they do, is complain. I mean, there's always reasons to complain, right? I mean, wouldn't you guys say that? I mean, there's always a few things that you're like, man, I wish that was better. You know, I, I mean, like, Lord, at 26 years old, I started getting gray hair. Lord, I don't understand what's up with that. I take a picture next to my friend, and I look like his dad, or, you know, it's weird, and, my wife, the same thing. People tell her that all the time. Oh, what's your dad's name? No. <laughs> no, not exactly that. Not to that point. But I'm like, Lord, I don't get it, you know. I mean, we could, we could find so many things to complain about. You know, so everybody's in different spots in their walk with the Lord. But, you know, others, uh, just the way that they're wired. I will say this. If you are going to pour out your heart, you know, for the most part, Pour it out to the Lord. Pour it out to the Lord. And I think that's what Job wanted to do. But his friends came in and, and they attacked him and they almost cornered him to where he almost had no other way to go. It, to be honest with you, it kind of reminds me of Paul the Apostle who was such a, a, a beautiful minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was an apostle, but people were coming against him and so he almost forced him you know, to boast in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and he had to boast about his infirmities and boast about his seals of being an apostle. You know, almost forcing him. I think that's kind of what they're doing right here. They're kind of forcing Job to defend himself. But as he does, he says there, you know, please be quiet. Let me speak. And 
In verse 14, he says, you know, I'm saying this, and I know it might arouse God's judgment, but I got to say it. And, and notice what he says there in verse 15. Though he, he slay me, yet will I trust him. For us, man, that's an awesome verse. Because, you know, something little happens in our life, and we don't trust him anymore. I mean, in comparison to that, to slay someone is to kill someone violently. And Job said, even if God killed me violently, I would still trust him. You know, what a, a place to be, you know? To trust means to have this uh, faith. It's a firm belief in the ability or the reliability of something or someone. And Job had this faith. He had this firm belief in God's ability, God's reliability. You know, he had a, a faith, a firm belief in that. Not necessarily, here's the thing that's most important. Not to work out your plan. It doesn't, that's not what it's about. It's to work out God's plan. And when you understand that, when we come to that place of understanding it, that this is all about what he's doing, that he's going to work it out for good because he's so efficient, he's working in so many lives in so many different directions, then we can understand that even though we go through these things, that, that even though it seems so bad that he, that he would slay me even, you know, I can trust him. And that doesn't mean that we can't express ourselves, and Job definitely expresses himself, but it does mean that, that we can, can wonder, you know, in a certain sense. If you think about it, God is wonderful because so many things that he does uh, make us wonder. You know, some of the things are, wow, Lord, how did you do that? How did you make the clouds and the sky and the sun and, and this planet? Lord, how did you, you know, make a man and a woman coming together and they can then procreate and, and a child is born? How... How, how wonderful that is. And then you wonder how he could do it. And then sometimes you wonder why he did it. Or why did that happen? You know, why is this little baby, Armando, experiencing what he's experiencing in the, in the, in the hospital? Why is my son, my daughter, my, you know, kids or friends or, you know, and we wonder. You know, there are many things that we don't understand. And so Job, he questions. He, he does some complaining. He wants to defend himself. He wants to present his case. He just can't really hold his tongue. Notice we read that there in verse 19 and 15 and 18. Look at verse 19. It says, Who is he who will contend with me? If now I hold my tongue, he said, I perish. It's like, man, I got to talk. I have to talk. You know, it was a case filled primarily with questions for God. And I think that God is okay with that. Do you guys have that type of relationship with God? Just out of curiosity? You know, some people here, you know, I don't know, maybe not on a Thursday night because you guys are, are pretty dedicated, you know, but they don't even really talk to God. There's not like this intimacy with God and Lord you see you know what my son's going through and I don't understand it Lord and you know this is whatever his state of mind his future his past his condition and Lord I'm struggling with it can you help me Lord? or your daughter or yourself it's like some people are they're even too busy to do stuff like that God wants to have that type of relationship with you. And sometimes things have to happen. And again, not saying that God authors the bad things, but sometimes things have to happen to get your attention so that you would have that intimate relationship with him. But here's the thing. For a lot of people, even those things don't get their attention. And they still don't talk to God the way they should. 
God, help us to do that, you know? We got to carry our burdens to him. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, it says, Cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Go to God like this. You know, we have questions. We have complaints, maybe. You know, I'm reminded of the tragedy that took place in May of 2008 when Stephen Curtis Chapman's five-year-old daughter, she died. Think about that. Five-year-old died. She was run over by a car, but not just any car. It was a car driven by his son. So imagine the pain that he was going through for his daughter, for his son. It was an accident. It was a tragedy. You know, when you, when you one minute they were, they were celebrating the engagement of their eldest daughter, Emily, and then in a few hours, they were scheduled to celebrate the graduation of their other son, Caleb. So many things were ahead. There was a party planned. But both were rudely interrupted by the death of their daughter. And in dealing with the grief, uh, Stephen Cruz Chapman wrote a song. It's called Questions. And I do encourage you, even if you don't like his music, I, I wish he did because it's so good. But man, even if you don't, look up that song and uh, listen to the words. I'll, I'll share with you a few but in that song, in dealing with the grief, he wrote this song. And, and basically in the song, it's like, who are you, God? I mean, here's a guy faithful to the Lord. Man, he loves God. I know that, man. He's, this guy, even though I've never met Stephen Curtis Chapman, God has used him to disciple me. That's how much his words have meant to me over the years. I know he loves God. But here he is going through this, and he's like, who are you? And I don't understand what's going on right now. He said, where are you? In the song, where are you? So you're going through it, and it's almost like you're wondering, Lord, I, I, I just can't sense your presence. You know, or, or where were you? Lord, I know you never turned your head. Where were you when this happened? You could have stopped it. Or Lord, how could you? Those are questions that he and he deals with in the song. And, but, but he went on to write, as he's, as he's sharing those things, you don't get lost in that. He, he went on to write, and you know that I'm confused by all this mystery. You know that I get afraid. But if you know my heart as completely as I trust you do, you know that I am trusting you. So even in those questions, there's this deep-rooted faith that trusts God no matter what. You know, even in the darkest times, whatever it is that you'll be going through, we can trust him. We, we must trust him. And again, I know it sounds cliche, but it's true. Never doubt in the dark what God has shown you in the light. And no matter what it is, some of you here, you're going through suffering on this Richter scale of 10, some of you here are experiencing pain. Maybe it's a 1 or whatever, a 1.5. It's still there. I want you to know that you can take it to God. And, and you can trust him. You know, Job had plenty of questions and lots of complaints, but it didn't mean that he lost his faith. And we're all different. Some of us here never will complain. Others, you're complaining to God himself. But the fact is that as we go through this, we got to understand what we learn from the life of Job. You know, he had a lot of Bible truths in his heart, even though he didn't have a Bible. Job 121, he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I mean, he knew that. And how many people are, are they're, they're neglecting their relationship with God because of their pursuit of materialistic things that they that are just temporal. But Job knew that. Job knew in Job 2, 9 through 10, his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? I mean, we should embrace both because it's all part of God's plan. And what I've learned in life is that those who have depth of character are those who have gone through the fire. Job knew that. Job 19.25, we'll see it later. He says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. I mean, he knew this before he even had a Bible. My Redeemer lives. He 
knew the next verse, Job 19, 26, And after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I shall see God. I mean, he knew that. You know, one day I'll die, I'll have a new body, and think about it. Do you guys get excited about that? We will see God. Job knew that. He, Job 23, 9 through 10, the Bible says, When he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right, I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. I mean, Job is kind of saying, like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know the details of all these things, but God does. And as I go through these trials, I know that I'm going to come out stronger. As you go through the trials and you trust God and you allow him to flex his muscles and show up, watch what happens, how you will be the one to come out stronger. You know, in the church today, and I just want to say this as a side note, there's a lot of immature Christians a lot. And it's like the faith that is weak. I've been walking with the Lord for so many years. And the reason is because they haven't learned the word. They haven't dedicated themselves to when they go through trials to keep their eyes on the Lord. Because if you go through a trial with your eyes on the Lord, you come out stronger. If you go through a trial and you take your eyes off the Lord, then you have to go through the trial again <laughs> and again and again and again. Job said, you know what? I know one day I'll come forth as gold. We should have that heart. Job had his questions, but he did know the Bible. And so Job prayed in verse 20. He said, only two things do not do to me, and then I will not hide myself from you. Number one, withdraw your hand far from me. And number two, let not the dread of you Make me afraid. Job says, this is my prayer, Lord. Um, number one, don't withdraw your hand from me. Job says something pretty cool, kind of like, I won't go away if you won't. And I tell you what, God won't go away. You know, he knew how powerful and how personal God's hand upon him was. It was by the good hand of God upon people that anyone has ever done anything that's good. Has anyone ever made it through any of these trials? You know, God's hand is upon you. Did you guys know that? You know, David realized the importance of this, and he wrote about it in Psalm 139, verse 5. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. I mean, imagine if I went up to you, you know, and I put my hand on you, and I'm like, hey, I'm with you. I mean, you'd probably be like, well, that's pretty cool, you know, but please take your hand off, you know, probably something like that. But, but when God does... You know, we see the importance of this. Even in the early church, Acts 11, 21, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. And Job is just asking that God would keep his hand upon him in reference to the way he personally and intimately would lead his life and protect him. And the second thing Job prayed there in verse 21 is kind of like along the lines of, Lord, let my reverence of you Never turn into an unhealthy terror or fear. You know, and this is probably how Job's friends saw God, as a God with a club in hand, you know, ready to pounce and even eager to do so with anyone who got out of line. You know, it's a very unhealthy picture of God. The NLT translated this way, let me not be terrified of your awesome presence. And so... I was talking to someone the other day, and they were telling me this about, um, and again, no, they were just saying that when they were in the Catholic church and they used to see a priest, they said that they felt like they couldn't talk to them, like they were really afraid. And, you know, I'm not saying that's anything necessarily about the priest, but it is something about the truth is, I told this person, I said, I want you to know something. Jesus is approachable. I mean, he is. I mean, we can, we can go to God. Unless we find ourselves, you know, afraid of God, and we don't. I, I think of that passage in Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. When Adam fell, the Bible says that he hid, and he, they you know, hid themselves from God. And so, you know, God was walking through the garden and saying, where are you? And, you know, he's just talking to the Lord. And he said, I, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid. 
because I was naked and so I hid myself. And I pray that we're not like that, that we're not afraid and we don't hide ourselves from God, but that we know we can come boldly, even though we're not worthy, even though some of you here messed up today, probably, huh? You are messed up, <laughs> kind of, you know? Did you know that you can go to God? Look at verse 22. Then call and I will answer, or let me speak. Then you respond to me. How many are my iniquities and sins? Make me know my transgressions and my sin. He said, Lord, let's talk. If you call, I'll answer. And if I speak, will you respond? And, you know, kind of like, you know, he was knowing that it wasn't a result of his sin, but again, asking again, Lord, is there sin? No, I don't see this as a result of sin, but if it is, Lord, please show me. And that's an awesome prayer to pray. Psalm 139, 23 and 24 is the same thing. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, show me. You know, that's it's a beautiful prayer to pray. In the rest of this chapter, we see Job is just having a tough, tough time. Look at verse 24. Why do you hide your face and regard me as your enemy? I mean, he thought that God saw him as his enemy. Those thoughts were rolling through his mind. Will you frighten a leaf driven to and fro, and will you pursue dry stubble? I mean, here we see that he felt like a frightened leaf flying aimlessly, violently in the rushing wind. Verse 25, will you, verse 26, for you write bitter things against me and make me inherit the iniquities of my youth. You know, here we see his thoughts were that he, you know, was thinking that God was writing this bad book, some sort of sadistic story with his life. I mean, he was experiencing condemnation for the past sins of his life that had been forgiven and forgotten by God. You know, the enemy, he'll remind you of the past because the Bible says he's an accuser of the brethren and he accuses them day and night. No, you got to remind him that that's forgiven. And I remember even one time someone came up to Corey Ten Boone and they were telling her, you know, I can't believe this person did such an awful thing to you. And I love what Corey Ten Boone said. She said, you know, I don't remember. As a matter of fact, you know, I, I distinctly remember forgetting all about that. And, I, and that's what God does. Do you guys understand that? I don't know how God does it because we're not capable of doing it, well, in a certain degree. But I don't know how God does it, but he forgets it. He casts your sins behind his back. He casts them as far away as the east is from the west, and he says, I will remember them no more. And why do we? The enemy condemns us. You know, he's saying, Lord, this is something that I did when I was, you're getting me back. And verse 27, you put my feet in the stocks and watch closely all my paths. You set a limit for all the soles of my feet. Man decays like a rotten thing, like a garment that is moth-eaten. You know, here we see Job talks about his feet and how he felt that God not only had his feet chained, but was watching and kind of just waiting for him to make the slightest wrong step so that he can get him, you know. And verse 28, here I am just wasting away as a man. Little did he know that God still had great plans for his life. You know, all this from a godly man. And so we can relate I think and you know if you ever feel like you're feeling these feelings or thinking these thoughts you know you're actually in good company I think that our day will come I wish I could tell you that nothing bad will ever happen to you but as a pastor as a friend as a Christian I, I gotta tell you because we live in a fallen world with fallen bodies and fallen angels that we're fighting we're gonna have these things happen and when it does my prayer is that we will ha stand because of the fact that we know these truths that we're studying in the book of Job. You know, one last thing before we have communion. You know, Job wanted reasons. We read earlier in verse 3, if you turn back there, look what he says in verse 3, but I would speak to the Almighty and I desire to reason with God. 
know, he wanted to reason with God, and that's okay, but here's the thing. At the end of the day, remember, the best reasoning we could ever do is rooted in the grace of God, you know? Isaiah 118, it says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And that's you. You know, some of you hear crazy testimonies, man. Your background is just, I, I don't even want to hear it, man, because I'll, from this point forward, be afraid of you, man. I, it's crazy things that have happened. You, not just you, your sins, you were like as red as crimson. You were like, we were like red, like the, you know, I, I know I know we shouldn't use this visual, but, you know, you guys ever seen the, the caricatures of the devil, he's red with a pitchfork and the, the pointed tail. He was, he was red, huh? That was you. That was us. But he says, but even though your sins were red like crimson, you'll be as white as snow. How does that happen? How does that happen to you? And we all know it's the blood of Jesus, huh? That as you place your faith in Christ, that we are washed and made white. There's a beautiful passage in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white. How? In the blood of the Lamb. Aren't you happy about that? Man, I can't believe it, man, but we have to. That we are forgiven, that we are accepted, that this is the relationship that we have he did all the hard work by dying on the cross and suffering for our sins and bearing the punishment that we deserved. And now all we have to do is, it sounds almost too good to be true, but it is true. And that's why they call it the gospel, the good news, that as you place your faith in Christ, then you and I, we will be white as snow. That's the reasoning that we come away with. And I pray you guys will have made that decision already. I think all of you are here are saved. But you just never know, man, if you have never given your life to Christ or maybe it hasn't really taken root, I pray that tonight would be that night. And so, Lord, we thank you for loving us. Lord, we thank you for just uh, preparing us, Lord, for those days, Lord, ahead in which we will experience the trials of life. Father, I pray that as we partake of communion today that everyone here will be ready for that time, Lord, and that we, uh, just having placed our faith in Christ, will be able to appreciate the cross more than we have in the past. That tonight, Lord, you would kindle a, a new fire, that you would do a new work. Lord, that we would get really, really, really personal and just pour out our heart the way Job did. And Lord, I just thank you for that cross. I pray that tonight as we partake of communion together, that you would open our eyes more, open our minds, open our hearts, open our understanding more to be able to see this great act of love on your part for us. So Lord, bless this time as we worship, as we have communion. When I pray in Jesus' name, amen.
There is nothing like your love There is nothing like your love Let's pray for the bread. Lord, I thank you so much for what this bread symbolizes. The precious body of Christ that was broken for us Lord, to show us the love that you have. And Lord, as we hold this in our hand, I pray, Lord, we would hold this in our heart. Lord, I pray as we partake together that we would truly take it in and that we would never be the same, no matter what we've done or who we are, that we would all know, God, that you love us. And even though we go through hard times, you demonstrated that love when you laid down your life for us. And so, Lord, I pray as we partake together, Lord, that we would remember you. You said, do this in remembrance of me. Because I know, Lord, it's so, it's so easy, it's so tragically frequent that we forget you in our life. So, Jesus, we remember you. We love you. We thank you. Bless this bread to our heart, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake. Let's pray for the cup. Lord, we thank you for what this cup symbolizes the blood of Christ that washes away our sins. And Lord, I, I know what that blood means. It, it wasn't just that you cut yourself or they nailed a, a, you to a cross and you bled. It meant that you died. You died for us. You didn't just go halfway or 90%. You died. For us when we deserve to die Lord I thank you for that blood I thank you for that truth Lord and I pray that we would know that the blood of Christ it really does make us as white as snow and we are forgiven and we not only have the love that you offer it has a life that we, you offer to us Lord and so I pray that tonight as we partake of this cup together that we would know that and we would live that life. Or bless this cup to our hearts, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Let's all stand together. And you know, you don't have to, we're going to sing a song and we're going to close. You don't have to you know, go away right away. If you want to, you could even just pray right where you're at and just really make sure that you're in tune with Him, that you're in right relationship with Him. I see Him doing such a, a beautiful work in, in your life, and I get encouraged, and I, I know God's working in my life too, and I'm, I'm super excited about that. But just I want to make sure that we don't just, you know, go to church service and then leave and we don't really experience or, or re, have this relationship with God. And so, um, you know, we're going to worship. And, and if you want to pray, you might even pray with someone next to you. Or if you want to come up, we'll be up here as, as pastors. We can pray with you as well. But, you know, I just want to make sure before you leave, you know, maybe even say something like, Lord, okay, what am I, what am I going away with? What do you want me to remember? And then as you go, I want you to do this, okay? I want you to love one another. Love one another. And sometimes that means it's a correcting love, but you know it's deeper than that. Okay, no matter who it is, I pray at home, here, wherever it is that God sends you, that you love. Okay? Okay, God bless you.
Have a great evening. God bless you.